Okay, a little dedication video to my latest completed project. It is a rare bird. It is an Adler Model 17. Now, I'm currently aware of one other example of these machines. It is in the hands of a Russian collector. Um, I'm sure there is more. I haven't seen them. I've seen a handful of shouldered models. Uh, the Model 15, which is the relatively bare bones Adler standard that came from this lineup with a single typeface and no special accessories. It came with no form of interchangeable segments, which the Model 16 was something um, that made it, it was something that made Model 16 unique. These machines are thrust machines, much like the Empire and the Wellingtons that were dished out around the turn of the century and later on. And the way that works is instead of swing bars or a single type element, you have thrust uh, levers that slide over a metal plate underneath this cover in order to make an imprint on the page. I'll make a demonstration video of this typewriter later on, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an update and an insight into one of the rarest typewriters I own currently. Uh, the Atler 17 is distinguishable from the 15 and 16 in that it has four Actually, no. Four rows of characters on the type bars, and it's capable of typing in two languages, alphabets, characters. This typewriter is capable of typing in Cyrillic. It's a Bulgarian Cyrillic, I must emphasize, and in Latin. And it's quite interesting to see the ingenuity that went behind the design of this typewriter. Like I said, the Model 15 was a bare bones model. The Model 16 had an interchangeable segment, which meant that you could undo the screws, the top part would come off, you go to the store at the time, buy yourself an accessory kit, which would allow you to change a different typeface into the machine that came in a little box, usually carrying case. And then the 17, the set with the Model 17, they decided that it would be not an interchangeable mechanism, but they would feature more characters than usual. So, as you can see, it does have a full set of Cyrillic characters and Latin characters. Now, if you would also care to note, the layout for our, our alphabet is completely different from the QWERTY arrangement that we are all used to, or Azerty or Accords. Um, this has been a challenge to use. I've, I'm up to about 20 words a minute now, which I pride myself on. It took me a day to get there. This is different. It is an experience. However, it is an interesting machine in that the design was introduced in the late 1900s, early 19 teens, and according to the database, and the serial number. This machine was made in 1940. I find it really hard to believe because the design would have been so dated by then. But there's a few traits that make me believe it's true. As hard as it is to see, the Adler logo on the top um, seems similar in those that were manufactured in the 1930s. And the key rings on this machine are made out of Bakelite. And how do I know that? It's because the shift key is chit. There's a few other odds and ends that just make this typewriter not seem what it is. Um, like I said, the design seems unchanged since the typewriter was introduced 110 years ago. And there are various factors that make it very confusing to properly date this typewriter. It is, however, a gorgeous typewriter. The decals and the pinstriping are a little worn. It has seen use for sure. You can tell by the space bar wear. The brass tag on the front, as far as I could decipher the Bulgarian Cyrillic, it says Georgi Gabochev, I think, and then it says Joint Stock Company Sofia the capital city of Bulgaria and I think there was another indicator besides the keyboard layout of course that uh, the machine came from there I found it up here in Canada though last year for a very friendly price 
and uh, you can pass something like this up. It is absolutely beautiful. It has matching spools. This machine, by the way, carries currently a 1 n 3 8 cotton ribbon that I got from Baco Supply. On its original, I presume, nickel plated spools that feature the crest and the name. The typewriter is 99.9% .9 rust free. There is some speckles on one of the type bars. And I think that was it. I always say I wish I had a better setup for filming this, but I hope it's enjoyable regardless. Serial number is stamped on the side of the machine. If you'd care to trace that with the database, feel free to do so. You'll find it was made in 1940. And it does not have a tabulator. Now, we'll go over some of the functions. I know almost all of them. I still have a few to go through. Um, I'm not sure what these do, but I will get to that. This here on the front is the margin release and the margin release lock that allows you to bypass the right margin altogether until you release it. And here we have the shift lock, shift keys, dual sides. This lever on the side here, quite intriguing, is the backspace. Machine Gun Kelly would have liked this typewriter. Because all you have to do is pull the trigger and you're back one space. This pedestal button over here is your carriage release with a healthy chime from the bell at the end. This lever over here is what makes it different from the model 15 and 16. What that does is if you push that in, it disengages a carrier bearing, a roller bearing that runs through not one. But two guidance tracks, guidance, guidance tracks, however you would say. There's two tracks there. I'm trying to bring it into focus just underneath there. And that determines the height of the carriage, whether you're shifting or not, in order to type the correct characters. This is essentially a language exchanger, to put a nice term on it. It's, it toggles between the two, or between the... Um, two sets of characters that this typewriter is fitted with. And then here on this side, that is the ribbon direction switch, determines which way the spools turn. And like I said, this machine is a thrust operated typewriter, so the type bars slide over a metal plate in order to hit the platen, which is, from what I have gathered, above average condition. It is still quite pliable and I have to sand down the feed roller just a smidge in order for the flat, apologies, the flat spots to go away and that seems to have worked. And I have to say that the plating on this machine is still in very nice shape. It's a beautiful typewriter. The paper bell has a kink in it. It was much worse when I got it. I'm not sure how they managed that, but this is about as straight as I can get it. And a little lock there to prevent you from lifting them while you're typing. And then over here, we have the line spacing switch, which is that part. It does not have a color selector, obviously. But, uh, yeah, this is about as good of an insight standing hunched over my desk here as I can give you of this typewriter. I will do a typing sample video. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments section because I'd be happy to answer them. These are beautiful typewriters. I am very happy to have found this example. Usually not a big early German fan, German typewriter fan, but... Uh, this is an exception. This is a gorgeous machine and Adler outdid themselves when they manufactured This is perhaps why they made them for so long because they're well built, they're well designed, very nice to use. They re resemble a Remington standard from the 30s a bit. And it's so difficult to praise a machine 
when you don't know when it was made. Like I said, it could be made either in the teens or it was made in 1940 according to the database. So what do you base the standards off of? I'm not sure. That said though, I'm ending the video here. I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry if it was a bit jumbled. Um, stay tuned for a typing sample video and keep in touch.